All right, next, let's go ahead and get started with the chapter 14 lecture on biotech. And I think this is going to be a good chapter for you guys. You guys have already done genetics, has a plant breeding aspect to it, of course, with Mendel's peas. You guys have done propagation by cuttings. You guys have done tissue culture already, and you've done seed propagation. So a lot of this stuff should be familiar, at least to give you a basis to start from. Okay, so the flowering plants or the angiosperms comprise 250,000 living species. That's a quarter of a million. However, it's only six species that are gonna give us more than 75% of all of the calories, okay? So the first few, not too big of a surprise are from our, our grains, from our monocots and grasses, our wheat, rice, and corn, okay? Then there's also potato, sweet potato, and cassava. Okay, then if we add these next eight crops, then that's going to complete the list of major crops worldwide. So just between these 14 species. So we can throw in sugar cane and sugar beet, beans, uh, which would be like the phaseolus vulgaris, the common bean, soybean, barley, sorghum, coconut, and banana. So in some uh, ways you can argue that any domesticated plant has been genetically modified. Although that's not the truth, it is more so that it has been influenced, okay? But there has been human intervention and uh, selection that influences the success of the different plants and whether they carry on to the next generation, okay? And of course, this is ongoing. It's a process that we're still pursuing now. Okay, so initially in... The Near East, about 10,000 years ago, plant domestication began, okay? In Asia, that was about 1,000 years later, about 9,000 years ago, and then 3,000 years later for the New World. The first crops, as you may be able to guess, were the cereal grains, like we saw for our top three crops worldwide now. Okay, following that, the root crops and the legumes were domesticated. That was followed by the vegetables, then our oil seeds, our fiber crops, and our fruit crops. And it wasn't until about 2,000 years ago that our forage plants, those would be for feeding to animals, uh, ornamental plants, and then our pharmacopoeia uh, were actually domesticated. So that was fairly recent. Okay, so here we can see a map of where many of the crops originated from around the world. From Central America, we have corn, tomato, cotton, zinnia, and marigold. North America, we have sunflower. Okay, for South America, sweet potato, yam, cassava, potato, and peanut all had their origins in South America. Okay, in the uh, Middle East, we see wheat, barley, and apple. In uh, Northern Africa, we see sorghum. And then in East Africa, that's where coffee originally came from. Okay, then for Asia, perhaps rice isn't um, a big surprise. Um, and we also see soybean, peach, apricot, and banana that all originally arose from different parts of Asia. Okay, so those are like the evolutionary beginnings where the, the crops came from. And let's talk about a little more about how they've been influenced and the process of plant breeding. Okay, so as opposed to natural selection, this would be human guided evolution or uh, breeder selection. So some of the traits that breeders are interested in improving are yield, pest and disease resistance, and also abiotic stress tolerance. Okay, so disease resistance, that could be things like Phytophthora, all right? Pest resistance, perhaps uh, resistance to aphids, 
And then for abiotic stress here, we would be thinking about things like water and heat stress tolerance. Okay, and in order to improve the varieties, we have to have genetic variation. So if you think back to chapter 12, remember that uh, reproduction does not lead to completely new genetic variation, right? It just means that we have new combinations of the alleles. Okay, so there has to be a source that gives us that foundational genetic variation. Okay, so for plants that are able to cross or are sexually compatible, there are different strategies depending on whether this is a self-pollinating or an outcrossing species. So self-pollinating, you may remember, can self-fertilize. And here we're gonna have a lot of homozygosity. The individuals are going to be very similar to one another, or that is to say they're highly homologous. Okay, that makes sense since the uh, genes from both parents are actually just coming from the same plant. So here we're going to see mostly inbreeding and some examples of crops that are self-pollinating and are bred this way are wheat, rice, oats. We also see peas. Remember, peas are our like quintessential uh, self-pollinating plant. All right, and then some fruit trees also like apricots, nectarines, and some citrus. So typically the strategy is going to be from pure line selection. So if we take the uh, seeds from several plants that are the result of self-pollination, then we can grow those out in the field. Uh, you would take the pods that are from an individual plant and grow them in the same row. And then the most desirable row is selected. Okay, so we'll have different strategies for cross pollination. This has to be fertilized from another individual. That makes sense, it's cross pollinating. So one of the uh, good things here with the cross pollinating is that they're highly heterozygous. And this can lead to hybrid vigor where we have new combinations, they're actually, um, bigger, better, yielding, um, or more resistant than even the parents that um, the material started from. So some examples of cross-pollinating plants, we have corn, rye, alfalfa, most of the fruit trees, uh, most also of the nuts, which are also often going to be dioecious, and then many of the vegetables as well. So we can think about things like uh, tomatoes. Tomatoes of fruit. <laughs> All right. But for mass selection, this is going to be one of the strategies that's used for our cross pollinating uh, breeding strategies. So here, a large number of plants are selected from a population, and then those are going to be used for the next round of crosses. Okay. So the seeds that come from the most vigorous plants that have the desirable traits are going to be propagated. And this is going to continue for many generations. So essentially, this is going to be uh, selecting early and often and selecting a large number of plants, but eventually leading to just a few selections at the end. Okay, so I mentioned the hybrid vigor. Another word for this is heterosis. On the other hand, if, if you do not have outcrossing, the drawback of this is that it can lead to inbreeding depression. So many times you'll have self incompatibility where there's actually a molecular mechanism that will prevent self fertilization. And the reason for this is that the inbreeding in the outcrossing crops is going to often lead to deleterious traits and unfit individuals that wouldn't be great for growing crops. Okay, so typically we will use self-pollination to make the inbred lines. That's gonna be similar to the pure lines that you saw with the self-pollinating crops. They're gonna be completely homozygous and have identical copies of the genetic information, um, but they're not really good uh, crop plants in and of themselves. They may have some desirable traits. The purpose of the inbred lines is actually to make a hybrid cross or an F1 and that would be then the generation that is carried to market, okay? 
When we talk about hybrid seed or an F1 hybrid, that's where we're talking about here, where we have two homozygous lines uh, that are then crossed to make a new hybrid, hopefully more vigorous than either of the parents that it started from. Now, on the other hand, we could also have heirloom vari varieties. Those are going to have inherent variation because they're more like a small population of siblings. Okay, so remember that we have to have a source for our variation in order to be able to improve the crops. You know, we can't just sit around waiting for a random mutation to come along and save us. <laughs> All right, so what is the solution for this? That would be germplasm conservation. So germplasm, it is going to be made either just from the plant's DNA. It could be uh, cuttings that are um, conserved, such as for woody materials. So we might have um, unrooted cuttings that are held in refrigeration, or it could be seeds. Uh, so the problem is that typically we prefer to plant out uh, uniform crops so that we have uniform germination time, uniform development, similar yield, and then we can harvest everything at the same time. So the crop plants that are existing are often not a good source for variation because you know it's all sort of the same. And remember, if one individual in the field is susceptible to a pest, that means every individual in the field is susceptible if they're all identical to one another. Okay, so we have gene banks or germplasm repositories that are set up uh, by the USDA. And those are uh, meant to conserve and save the germplasm for later use. So it may be the case that um, there are varieties of corn from Central America that are not very useful for production but they have a disease resistant gene that could be integrated through traditional breeding methods to improve corn uh, so that it would use less pesticide because it would have a natural uh, resistance. So that could be a use for some of this germplasm or the old seeds that are stored in gene banks. Okay, so there are some instances uh, where the species will be incompatible with one another. So. Usually, in order to um, you know, create a new variety, you will need to stay within the same family, okay? But it is possible to cross uh, species boundaries. So an example of this that uses tissue culture is the protoplast fusion. So you'll have the cells with the cell wall stripped away, and um, it can be dissolved by an enzyme. And those will be grown in a suspension culture. It's really similar to what we saw with our plant tissue culture media, but it doesn't have agar. It'll just have the sugar and the nutrients and hormones that will be needed to proliferate the cells. Okay, the protoplast, which is essentially everything but the cell wall, is the living part of the plant cell, are going to be joined together. One way to stimulate this would be to use an electrical current and it'll cause the cells to become joined together. And then the successful somatic hybrids, which they are somatic because it's like the body cells of the plants coming together. It's not like a, a sexual reproduction, but it's somatic hybridization. Those are gonna be grown in tissue culture. So as you can imagine, this is very complicated. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. So it hasn't been successful in many cases to uh, provide commercial uh, varieties. Okay, now transgenic plants, on the other hand, those have been pretty wildly uh, successful. So this is a way that we can actually go beyond even uh, the plant family. We can even take DNA from a completely different kingdom you know, we could have animal DNA that's integrated into a plant or uh, perhaps bacterial DNA that's integrated into a plant. And this would be for the purpose of giving it a trait that enhances crop production somehow. Okay, so the, the transgenic plants will use recombinant DNA technology. 
All right, so they use restriction enzymes. And you can see here in the diagram that we have the top strand and the bottom strand. And essentially, they're running in opposite directions. Okay, these are the two strands of the DNA. And the restriction enzymes, the restriction enzymes will recognize palindromic sequences. The palindromic sequences essentially are going to be running forward on one strand, and then you'll have the same sequence that's running the other direction on the bottom strand. So you can see here, for example, we have GAATTC on the top, and then on the bottom, GAATTC. So once these cuts have been made, now you have a sticky end or a, a five prime overhang here on the top that's ready to uh, bind with another piece of DNA. And this happens really readily. Uh, DNA can easily break and rebind either with these restriction enzymes, or you can think about uh, the way that viruses are so successful. All right, so here we can excise or cut out a piece of DNA that we are interested in introducing into another organism, like one of our crop plants. Okay, so we'll use bacterial plasmids, which are a small circular piece of DNA, and they're easily exchanged between individuals, and they can even be conferred to plants. The thing that's nice about bacteria is it grows really quickly. So we can clone a gene and make many, many copies of it using the already onboard machinery that bacteria such as E. coli already have. Okay, so the gene of interest is cut from the foreign DNA by the restriction enzymes. Okay, and then it's going to be inserted into the plasmid. The um, bacteria will readily take up the plasmids one way to do this is to uh, stimulate them with chemicals, or you can also stimulate them well, with electroporation, that is with electricity. Okay, and then they'll take up the plasmid, and then they're going to multiply, and that's, like I said, why it's called cloning, because they make many, many copies then of the genetic material that they've just taken in. Okay, and here we have a more visual diagram of this whole process. So here's our bacterial individual. It's already naturally carrying a plasmid. And the plasmid can be taken out or they're commercially available as well. And a gene of interest or a fragment of DNA that carries the gene of interest can then be inserted into the plasmid. It's going to naturally bind if it has these sticky ends where one of the strands is hanging over a little more. Um, it will readily bind with other pieces of DNA. All right, then the recombinant plasmid, which is the plasmid with the new piece of DNA inside of it, will be taken up into the body of the bacteria. And then when they reproduce naturally, they're gonna make many, many copies of this plasmid that contains the gene of interest that you eventually wanna get into the plant. Okay, so what is the process for that? That is transformation. So here the plasmids will be removed from E. coli and the, the gene can be cut out here or it's possible to transfer the uh, gene from E. coli to agrobacterium. And the agrobacterium has transfer DNA or tDNA that can go into the plant. So agrobacterium tumefaciens, if you listen to the name tumefaciens, it kind of sounds like easy tumor. <laughs> and the tumefaciens is so named because it causes a crown gall tumor on trees. So it naturally has this mechanism to inject DNA into plants from this bacterium. So when uh, this is used in the lab, they will take out the virulence genes. That is to say that they will remove the part that makes the plant infected. And then they're just using the process of injecting the tDNA in order to transform the plant. Okay, there's another technique here, which is particle bombardment. Uh, it's also called bioballistics. 
And this is going to be where you have tungsten or gold particles. They'll be coated with the DNA, and then they're going to be uh, shot into the plant cells. So I don't find it to be terribly mysterious. It makes sense when we know about the way that DNA can easily break and then reform that you could shoot a piece of DNA on a tiny particle and have it insert into the genome. So that makes sense to me. However, as you can imagine, there could be uh, off target insertions here where when you shoot in your new gene, you actually are disrupting an existing perfectly good gene. Uh, so it is a little bit random in terms of where the particle bombardment actually takes effect. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the transformation by agrobacterium. Okay, so th this is our agrobacterium individual. Okay, the DNA from the, uh, the foreign gene that we want to integrate into the plant is going to be taken up in the TI plasmid. And then in tissue culture, the plantlets will be infected with the agrobacterium. And the idea here is that the DNA will be then transferred to the plant chromosome. Okay, so here is what it looks like on the plant side instead of the bacteria side. Okay, so we have a regular herbicide susceptible plant. Then you'll make a callus culture from that. Remember the callus is undifferentiated masses of cells. And then those masses are going to be uh, disrupted by shaking or vibration, and they're going to be put into the suspension culture. So here, this one is the liquid nutrient culture. That suspension culture will be shaken and incubated with the agrobacterium, and that's going to be carrying your gene of interest that you want to get into the plant cells. Okay, after that, they're going to be typically washed with an antibiotic, because you do not want the agrobacterium to stay in your plant once it's carried forward. You want to get rid of that infection. Otherwise, once it's the plant begins to really grow, it's almost impossible to get rid of the agrobacterium. For the process of selection, typically a liquid culture with herbicide will be used. So one of the transgenes that you would put in your construct, let's say you're trying to make uh, uh, a higher yielding plant or a more stress tolerant plant is you would also put in an herbicides resistance gene. Okay, that will allow you to select because any of the individuals that don't have the transgene are going to be killed off by the herbicide. The remaining cells then can be grown out on uh, pea trees or in test tubes on a solid media. And then from there, they're going to grow into a plant. Okay, so now um, here we have our herbicide resistant transgenic plant that has the gene of interest in there. Um, this is a little bit simplified still because often the first generation of the transgenic plants are not stable and they need to go through uh, further self-pollination or further breeding just for a couple of cycles to uh, make them more stable and reliable. Okay, so there are some pros and cons of this. You guys may have heard a little bit about this. So something that you uh, may not be aware of is that some of the transgenic plants are actually more environmentally friendly. Um, the reason for this is if you consider BT corn, which is uh, has the gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, which creates a toxin that kills uh, bollworms and corn, which are basically a type of caterpillar. Um, this is helpful because there's less off-target effects. If the corn naturally produces its own pesticide, then that means that there's no need to spray. So there's less uh, overspray that's going on to a neighbor's property. The spray isn't going on people. And it's not hitting off-target organisms uh, that we're not actually feeding on the crop at all. This could be a bit controversial because we just looked at the herbicide resistant crops, which are Roundup Ready. And those are actually designed from the beginning to be used with 
herbicides. So noxious chemicals are still being sprayed. So take it with a grain of salt, but at least with the example of our BT corn, we can see that some of these transgenic crops could be more environmentally friendly. Okay, so there are some concerns. And one of these we talked about a little bit when we were looking at floral anatomy is that you could have this herbicide resistant gene that is actually integrated into a wild uh, crop plant relative. So remember we were looking at canola and then we were looking at the uh, synapsis alba and they're very similar to one another. So there is a concern about that. Um, and then also a concern about allergic reactions or toxicity that may occur. There hasn't been a lot of reliable evidence on this. However, there is quite a bit of discussion and uh, there is some evidence to support that as well. Okay, so hybrid varieties. We talked about this with the outcrossing crops just a few slides ago. Okay, so we'll have two pure lines that are going to be crossed to produce the hybrid seed. And um, this can, this F1 cross should actually give us a all identical population. However, they're going to be highly heterozygous. Okay, for our inbred lines, we can also produce seed through self-pollination and we can get highly homozygous lines. They're also going to be very similar to their parents. As opposed to the hybrids, those will be identical to one another, but they're going to be different from each parent. Okay, so we've talked about seed storage to some degree. You wanna have a dry environment as well as the right temperature. And often the seeds will be treated with a fungicide. Okay, and then you want to have a substrate that is moist enough that the seeds can imbibe water allowing for germination, but also that is going to have some oxygen and aeration to allow the roots to grow properly. Okay, so you guys have looked a little bit at asexual propagation. That's gonna use the vegetative parts of the plant as opposed to talking about flowers and seeds and making crosses. And here we have daylily, which is um, in some places a weed actually, and it can be readily propagated just by dividing it or chopping it in half. So here we have the example of crown division where the above part and the uh, below, above ground and below ground parts are being divided and you can directly just make uh, two plants readily. Okay, on the other hand, you also can do cuttings. So propagating the vegetative parts of plants. So when we use a stem, like we did with our portulacaria, then we're gonna see adventitious roots. The adventitious roots, those are roots where there were no roots before. So where you have made your wound or your new cut, you'll have de-differentiation. Often you'll see callus forming at the bottom. Um, and then it'll give you a new uh, root apical meristem. Often this is also stimulated by auxin. We've talked about a few different forms of auxin, including IAA, IBA, and NAA. So the result then of asexual plant propagation, we're expecting to have uniform copies that resemble the parents exactly. Okay, one of the disadvantages though, if the parent material is infected, then the propagules are going to be infected as well. Okay, layering. So you might have seen something similar to this with uh, mint plants. So uh, we've also seen this in a previous lecture with the strawberry plants and plants can do this naturally. We can also encourage them using this tip layering technique by taking some of the tips or the runners and burying them with a small amount of soil that will encourage rooting. And then we have created new plantlets. And the example that we have here is with blackberries. A similar technique is air layering. Instead of using the soil or the medium at the bottom, here you can just take a branch and wound it 
and layer it either with a cottony material or a pasteurized uh, peat and then wrap it. I've seen it wrapped either with parafilm or with foil. And then with that girdle, it will produce roots inside of that little package that you just made. And then you can go in and later cut off that branch and plant it directly. Okay, so a lot of tropical trees and shrubs are good for this. Okay, next is grafting. This is a type of asexual plant propagation. So here we're going to bring together a scion that's going to be the top that would be for our fruit trees, the part that is actually going to produce our fruit. So for the scion, we want to have traits um, that are desirable for our fruit production. And then the root stock is going to be the below ground portion. So for our root stock, often they do not produce good fruit, but they will be resistant to diseases such as nematodes. Um, or fungi like Phytophthora. And then there has to be, when this junction is made during the grafting between the scion and the rootstock, there needs to be good contact between the vascular cambium of each. That way, when they heal, they'll have that vascular connection throughout the entire stem of the plant or the, or the uh, trunk of the tree as it will become. Um, and then you can see that it has a protective layer and wrapping here. Typically, parafilm is used for that. Okay, and then micropropagation. So here is where we're going to do our sterile tissue cultures in test tubes. This is nice because we can grow a large number of plants in a small square footage. And it's we also don't have to water these plants when they're in the container. That is very nice. Uh, furthermore, they tend to grow very rapidly especially if you have the uh, correct media formulation for the plant that you're trying to grow. Okay, so in vitro basically means in glass. So they're grown in vitro in sterile medium, and then they'll be grown usually under uh, artificial lighting. Sometimes there will be uh, CO2 or um, humidity conditions that are maintained uh, for the atmosphere also in the grow room. So this idea relies on totipotency, and we talked about that way back in chapter two, and that's where a plant cell can give rise to an entire new plant. Okay, so the micropropagation process starts with the explant. The, we call it the explant because the explant is excised or it's cut, right? That's the part of the plant that's cut off. And then they'll be disinfected and they're inserted into the new growth medium. So the new shoots, the new leaves and stems that develop, we can refer to those as micro shoots. And each one of those new shoots can be divided and put into new media to further proliferate. Okay, the rooting medium typically will contain oxen and sometimes also activated charcoal to induce rooting. And then from there, those plants will be hardened off and they don't stay in the test tubes forever. The idea is to move them out into the outdoor environment, the greenhouse, the grow room, wherever it is that they're um, destined to finish out their life cycle. Okay, so we have uh, discussed a little bit about the origins of crops and evolution of crop plants, plant breeding for uh, sexually compatible, including self-pollinating and outcrossing, and then sexually incompatible germplasm, including the uh, somatic embryos. And we also talked about uh, transgenic plants. We talked about seed propagation as well as asexual propagation like air layering and grafting as well as plant tissue culture. All right, I think that's it.